son. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. He stood near the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. we bless you for your mercy we thank you Lord that though we are but dust you breathe life into us and even in our desperate times and even in the times where we just somehow fall down again and again your mercy is more we honor you Father we bless you Lord a couple of things we received um, the Hoving Home sent us uh, they were here doing their choir service a few weeks ago and they sent us a nice note that says, Dear the, Dear the Four Seasons, thank you so much for the, your gift of $850. It was given in response to the Sounds of Life Choir ministering to your church. We sincerely appreciate your offering and trust your people were challenged and blessed by the meeting. I want to thank each one of you who has had a part in making this ministry possible. It is your giving that makes uh, it possible for the lives of many ladies to be miraculously changed through the power of Jesus Christ. I, along with all of our ladies and staff, send our special love and thanks. And it's signed by Beth Greco, the president uh, uh, in, based in New York. And along with that, all kinds of good things. Uh, the Women's Resource Center, uh, we were doing the baby bottle campaign, and you all, again, were so faithful to uh, give funds for that. And um, they gave us a lovely... Uh, sharing truth on the sanctity of human life and for participating in the 2021 Baby Bottle Campaign, raising $2,969.15. So, yeah. So, we will hang that. And, uh, um, Don, Don Steele had made the suggestion, and I, I wrote down the, um, a couple of announcements. We don't have a lot this week, but... Um, 
he recommended we, we have them on the screen every week, so if you miss something, you can see it. Uh, so anyway, I didn't do that, Don, wherever you are. Where is Don? Oh, Don. Now, where is he? Just saw him. Oh, there you're, you're, yeah, you moved. Okay, good. Uh, anyway, I did get that note, and, and we will do that. Uh, other than Wednesday night, uh, uh, that's about it. We have a Bible study or a discipleship class Wednesday night at 7 if you're able to make it. And we've got things coming up this fall, but we'll uh, wait to tell you about that. And it's so good to see Mooneen back here doing the queenly wave. He looks beautiful. And is anybody here for the first time? I know this young man, I met you. I'm just going to come and ask your name, and we won't ask for all your history or anything. But hi, what's your name? Uh, my name is Isaac. Isaac, it's good to have you here. What brought you in here? Um, this is honestly my first time ever stepping inside a church. So. Oh, boy. Well, we're glad you came in. Hope we haven't scared you off. Yeah. I don't mean me. I mean all these people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If I could have the uh, host come forward. Any other announcements just before we zip along? Okay. If I could have the host come forward, and we're going to pray over the offering. This is Pat over to my right here in the green. And Ellen in the red. Looks just like Christmas, doesn't it? Red and green. I'm ready for Christmas in the middle of the July. I'm, I'm ready for colder weather, you know. So uh, I don't want to have to shop, but I am ready for colder weather. Let's uh, ask God to bless the offering this morning. Father, we love you and, and so appreciate you, Father. And we don't know what we would do without you. And we are thankful, Lord, for the way you, you bless our lives. And you tell us, Father, as you are a giver, that we are to give and it will be given unto us. And Father, we, we have found that here in the Four Seasons Church as we look at this drive for peanut butter and see the response of these generous hearts. As we think of the hearts of our people toward the ladies in recovery at the, women, at the, um, the Hoving Home. And as we think, Lord, of the sanctity of life and, and preserving babies or giving, giving innocent children the opportunity to live and breathe and get to know you and, and, and uh, have the opportunities that we've all had, Father. We're, we're grateful for the blessing of giving. We thank you that this is a giving church, Father. And this morning as we receive tithes and offerings, we ask for your blessing on what we're giving. And Father, we pray you would direct these funds. We're, we're thankful, Lord, for the ministries this church supports. But I pray, Father, that this would continue to be a, a giving church and and we would just see that uh, the abundance, Father. We've seen it throughout our church history that you have supplied, you've taken care of us, and we're just grateful to give back. Increase these offerings, bless these offerings, we ask in Jesus' name. And Lord, we come to before you as your people to pray that model prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, I would also encourage you, uh, Thelma Craig has been in the hospital and... and uh, She's on a ventilator with COVID, and uh, they would covet your prayers. Uh, be lifting her up. I know a lot of us have been praying, and uh, I know Robert's kind of a nervous wreck over it, as you can imagine, and uh, so we need to pray for uh, Thelma. Well, we're continuing uh, to talk about Moses. Uh, we have been uh, in a series called Moses, Man of Destiny. We're on part eight, and today's message is, is that any way to talk to God? Hmm. Wonder what that's going to be about. Huh. You know, as I've read over the years, I've been a Christian since 1970, 1973. And uh, you know how that is. You read portions of the Bible again and again and again in that amount of time. As, as I've read through Exodus and Moses' life over the years, uh, the portion of Scripture we're going to look at today just always delights me and has given me great freedom in my prayer life. How many of you would like to improve your prayer life? 
That's almost 100%. Yes, the rest of you must really have it down. <laughs> but you know, if you had a sheet of paper to just kind of on your own privately examine your prayer life uh, and you put a little check beside either poor or, or fair or, or good or excellent, even if you're in the good and excellent uh, category, we should all want to improve in, in the way we communicate with God. So we're going to talk about uh, going into those higher places with God and honest prayers today. Uh, would you just join me again in a word of prayer as we ask God to breathe on this message? Lord, you've laid this message on my heart and I need you to take it from my heart and from my tongue, from my lips and put it into the hearts of, of your people by the power of your spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name and God's people said again, amen. Now, over the seven lessons that we've had uh, up until today as we've looked at Moses, uh, we're not even into the miracles yet. You know, we're not even into the part of the film we all love, the, the plagues. What could be more fun, right? As long as those plagues are happening to somebody else, yeah. And we're not being infested with flies, right? Uh, but... Uh, we, we've seen how Moses has gone be, before Pharaoh doing exactly what God call, called him to do, to tell Pharaoh to let the people, the slaves, the Jewish people go, release, release that grip he has on them. And last week, our message was called, When Doing the Right Thing Brings the Wrong Results. And we saw that although Moses initially kind of dragged his feet as God was calling him, and then he sort of negotiated with God for a while. Uh, God uh, it, it finally gave him his brother Aaron to help him to be his mouthpiece. And so Aaron came to Moses 360 miles away from Egypt to Midian and met with his brother Moses. And Moses told him what God had said to him. And then the two of them head back to Egypt and they approached Pharaoh and they talked to Pharaoh to release the slaves. Uh, but I wanted to pause to just say something. We've looked at this, this scripture over the last number of weeks, but I, I want to say something about this particular portion uh, of scripture. And it's in Exodus 4.16. And it's what God said to Moses about the relationship with, with him and his brother Aaron. And, it, and God said this, it will be as if he, that's Aaron, were your mouth, and as if you were God to him. Now, when you and I have an encounter with God, as did Moses, you become as God to various people in your life. And when you're born again, you will represent God to the people around you. We're called Christians. Another way we could say Christian is to say Christ one, or little, little Christ, and, and so that's what we are in Jesus, and so many of us don't live uh, in, in the confidence of what God does in us, that you are a, a little Christ, you are a representative of Christ, and if you've walked with, any, uh, with the Lord any length of time, you will be representing God to people, and you'd be surprised how people view you, because we think of ourselves, uh, sadly, we don't think of ourselves well enough in that respect. Uh, and just to prove that people represent God to us, you just think about Billy Graham, right? Think about Billy Graham. Those of us of a certain age, to remember his ministry, he stood for God, didn't he? You looked at Billy Graham, you thought God. And we knew, and we all know, Billy Graham was just a human being, but he represented God. The lady who was instrumental in my salvation, just a lady with an eighth grade education, uh, Helen Engel, her name was, just a, uh, the mother of a friend of mine. Man, when I came to the Lord, oh, I looked at her like, wow. She was God to me. And people I've known over the years, over the many years I've known the Lord, certain pastors, certain godly people. I think of one pastor up in Henderson, I know Diane would know Don Frazier, and and uh, Don was just a kind of a simple country boy. Uh, I was in my 20s then, and, and this man was in his 40s, and uh, we became friends, and we'd go to lunch, and, and we'd, we'd talk, and I just, well, he just represented God to me. 
And no matter what we talked about, no matter where we went, we all, uh, he always would talk about Jesus. The conversation would always revolve around the things of God. So it's the same way for you. And as I've matured in Christ, and some of you hopefully can relate to this, uh, I, I represent God to various people. You know, I'm just a human being, but I walk with a living God. And it's the same way again for every committed Christian. If you've known the Lord any length of time, and if you're fairly new uh, in things of the Lord, that will happen eventually as you mature in, in the things of God. And one other thing I would say about this is that if you made a commitment to the Lord, but you're living like the devil, and there are some people who do that, you know, they go to church, they go to the altar, but you don't see a change in their life. I mentioned a guy we worked with years ago uh, for the first three years when we were doing shows in town, and this man made a commitment to Jesus, but man, uh, he was anything but like Jesus, you know. And that'll just turn people away from God. Now, in this man's case, he drew me close to God because he so annoyed me that I was constantly asking God, help me to deal with him. You know what I mean? <laughs> so Aaron communicates for Moses. He's like an agent, you know, for the client. Those of you, uh, the show business terms, you know. He communicates for Moses, and Moses stands uh, before Aaron as God. And they go on the orders of God to Pharaoh, and they do exactly what, what, what God told them to do, and everything turns ugly, we saw last week. Everything got, got worse, and Pharaoh makes this edict. He not only won't release the Jewish people uh, from their slavery, but he makes their labor even harder. He makes it impossible, in fact. He says, you're still going to make bricks out of mud, but I'm not going to give you the, the supplies to make those bricks. You're not going to get straw. You go find your own straw. And so things really get miserable. And we're going to just pick up in Exodus 5 and look at a few uh, verses. Exodus 5, 19 through 23. You can, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it'll be on the screen. So uh, things get ugly. They, they beat the foreman, the Jewish foreman, the uh, Egyptians do, make their lives miserable. And then it says in verse 19, the Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them, and they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Nothing like being blamed. <laughs> Verse 22, Moses returned to God and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Now that is not the way Moses would have prayed that prayer. It would have been more like this. Oh Lord! Why have you brought trouble upon these people? Ever since I went to him, you've just made it worse. You're just making our lives miserable. You've not rescued your people at all. What's up? You know? A real prayer. And until you and I learn to pray that honestly and that directly and that passionately with all of our hearts, we will, we will never come into the relationship that God intends us to have. Never experience what Moses experiences with the Lord. Now Psalm 51 verse 6 says this. Behold. Now that means pay attention. Listen up people. Listen up. Thou dost desire truth in the inmost being. And in the hidden part thou wilt make me know wisdom. God wants truth. When I found the Lord at 20, when he found me at 20, because that's really the way it works. We're, we're sheep. We're lost sheep. And the shepherd comes. And no matter how you came to the Lord, sometimes people just feel a, they're kind of looking for God. And they begin reading books. Oh, I'm going to read about Buddhism. I'm going to read about Mohammedism. I'm going to read, you know, I'm going to read these. But that's the Lord drawing, you know. Bible says, if you seek me, you'll find me if you look for me with all your heart. And so, when the Lord found me at 20, 
again, I had church background, so I, I prayed before bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mommy. God bless daddy. God bless Greg and Kathy. God bless uncle and, you know. Did those prayers. I prayed before dinner. We did if we thought about it. Usually the food was in our mouth before we thought about it. <laughs> but what was exciting is being able to talk to God. Uh, real, you know, being able to pray. I had a desire to pray. And I remember the, the day after I found the Lord in, on an evening, in the evening. And the very next day, uh, we drove to a mall and went into a Christian bookstore for the first time. And I bought myself a Bible. A, a living, you know, it was called the Living Bible, and it was a, because I grew up just with the King James, you know. And then I bought a book by, they had a number of celebrities that wrote books, and I bought a bat, book by Pat Boone. Boy, that's a long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> People don't even know Debbie Boone anymore. <laughs> but, you know, Pat Boone was a singer and a celebrity, and I never paid much attention to him, but suddenly, like a light went on, oh, that's, that's why he annoyed me for all these years. <laughs> and I bought this book, and it was called A New Song, and it was all about his career. It was all about how he uh, went from just being a believer to being filled with the Holy Spirit, how that changed his life. But he talked about how they would pray in, uh, over decisions about his career. This was like so new to me, this kind of praying about practical things. And I remember how we talk about uh, gathering with people around a pool in Beverly Hills. And I thought, wow, praying around the pool in Beverly Hills. Because I lived in the hills of Western Pennsylvania, you know. Wow, Beverly Hills. But he'd talk about these career things. And I remember saying to my mother, you know, it's so strange. All the years I've been alive, in our family, my, my dad never came home from his uh, optometric practice and said, let's, let's pray about some things at work, you know. So, so prayer became about everything. But I got to tell you the truth. Uh, when I prayed at 20 about my fleshly struggles and my inward thoughts, because there was this conflict going on. How can I be a Christian and think these kind of things and want these kind of things, you know? I thought, I can't. So, I, I was real cautious about the way I prayed about it. I kind of sanitized it, you know, for like four years. Anytime I'd pray about that, I, I don't know. I just was never real, really real before God with what was really going on in my life. And the bottom line, people, is God has seen you naked. <laughs> Inside and out, I mean, you know. And there's no use reaching for fig leaves trying to cover up all the things that God already has seen. He already knows. He knows better than you and I know what's going on in here. So after my first four years of being a Christian, I remember, you know, I was around a lot of non-believers, uh, as we all are, you know. And strangely, in show business, uh, I didn't see any, you know, really weird and wicked people, not much more than I see in the church. <laughs> Chew on that a moment. <laughs> In fact, I always said I was, in Thursday, I was in show business for 30 years and I never saw the weird things I've seen in ministry. <laughs> so, of course, you know, you don't deal with people the same way. But, you know, we were around musicians and stuff and a lot of these people that, are, uh, that don't know the Lord are just nice, decent people. They're not uh, hellions or don't seem to be. But I was uh, listening to some guy you know, we were friends with and he was a heathen. And he was just being so honest about his activities, all these ungodly activities, and all these ungodly thoughts, desires. And I envied that. And I don't mean I, don't mean I, I envied the uh, carrying out evil. I envied the honesty. So I began to pray, honestly, just from hearing this heathen, thinking, well, if a heathen can be open about his heathen life, then I should be able to be honest before my heavenly father and really talk openly. So this light came on. And I'm going to share with you a very profound bit of psychobabble. Would you like to hear some profound psychobabble? Maybe you've heard it. <laughs> it goes like this. 
You're only as sick as your deepest secret. You're only as sick as your deepest secret. So no more sprinkling sugar over the garbage can of my life. You know what I mean? All that rotten, rancid, smelling stuff. I don't have to sugarcoat anymore because God already knows. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, God said this to Samuel. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, we can look at people and they can look so saintly like all of you are looking this morning. Just really look. Ingmar, you look especially <laughs> sacred this morning. All in white, that white hair, white beard, white shirt. Ah, yeah. Uh. He looks at the heart, so at 24, I began just talking to God from my heart. John 8, 32, don't you love this? Jesus said this to us. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, nothing is more freeing than truth. It just uncomplicates everything. Now, many of us, if we'd been in Moses' shoes, where he had all this trouble, and the Jewish foremen are blaming him and Aaron for this trouble, we go before God and go, Dearest Heavenly Father, if it be thy will, please show me what to do. Please, 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 please. If I've done something wrong, please show me, God. I talked to Pharaoh. I probably didn't do it right. I know I'm supposed to pray for those in authority, so I ask God, you just bless him, God. Just bless Pharaoh. I'm not blaming this mess on you, God. It's probably my fault. I probably shouldn't have even brought it up. Please forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> now, Exodus 33, 11 says this. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. We sang that this morning. We sang that in the last song. We talked about, you know, let me see you face to face. So if God spoke to Moses face to face, that, means that, that meant that Moses spoke to God face to face. Jesus said this in John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Wow, friends. Now, I don't know if any of you uh, were watched Downton Abbey. Servants, you know. Yeah. Stephanie and I were watching Downton Abbey. I'd like to start a little show called Downtown Arby's. <laughs> Be based around food, you know. <laughs> Downton Abbey, or if you watch The Crown on Netflix, you know, The Crown. So you see the way servants talk to their superiors. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And there is no arguing or out the door they go. But, but friends don't talk to each other like servants, do they? Much more honest, especially the closer you grow with people, the more honest you can be. So the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. And face to face is not simply a posture or a positioning. It indicates relationship. Anybody been on a subway? Not two subways, that's with uh, downtown Arby's. Been on a subway. New York City, Stephanie and I were on a, uh, and uh, Boston and Washington, D.C. And so you're on the, your subway. And sometimes, you know, depending on the stops or where you're going, people come on, people go off, and it can get really crowded. And you can just picture yourself on a, on a subway holding on to one of those straps, and the people come real close, you know, uncomfortably close and if there's a stranger beside you like almost right in your face right just jammed in there or an elevator notice how people get quiet on an elevator push the button and you just don't want to even breathe while those other strangers are on there. but you're on a subway these people are really close you're not going to make eye contact with them right no because you don't know these people 
Not going to look at them. Not going to say anything to them. You're uncomfortable and you just can't wait for the stop and hope that they get off or the thing clears out. But if you're by your wife, your husband, someone close to you, that's not a problem, is it? Now, we all have spatial issues, so I'm not saying we have to be nose to nose with those we're closest to. But that's the difference. You can be face to face. When you know somebody, it's completely different than with a stranger. So when we're with strangers face to face, you notice that they're male or female. And people, that's all the choice we have, just so you know. Because I know you're hearing other things. Yeah. You notice if they're black or white or brown or gray or yellow or red or whatever color, you notice whether they're old or young, if they're attractive and not so attractive, average looking. Most people are average looking, you know. My dad used to say it's, it's just as freaky to see a really ugly person as it is to see a really good looking person. You know, most of us are in the middle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You notice whether they're groomed or they're disheveled, but that's all you see. You just see the outward appearance. But as soon as you see the face of a friend or somebody you're close with, a loved one, you, there's an instant recognition. It's, you see more than the face. You see everything you know about them, don't you? Think about picture faces like Lucille Ball. As soon as I say that, stuff cam- comes up. You know. All we know about her is from the television. You know, I grew up in the television generation. All I knew was television. Lucy was like my mother, you know. And when she died, it was just like, it was like losing a friend because Lucy was there all my life. But I really didn't know Lucille Ball. Just know the image. Ronald Reagan. Certain thoughts. Then you picture the face of your mother or your best friend or even your dog. Completely different thing because it all deals with intimacy. So there's a big difference in the faces of those you actually know. So we need to remember when we speak to God, he's not a force. He's not the force. May the force be with you. I bought this for Georgia and Savannah. Um, Yeah, or Georgia and Grayson. Yeah, Savannah's their mother. Yeah. So, Amy, I want to give these to you because you're going to see them this week. Yeah. So God's not the force. He's not that unknowable higher power. He's not the man upstairs. You know, I hate that. Hate when people say the man upstairs. Don't ever let me hear you say calling God the man upstairs. See, the, see that guy that gave us so much trouble in the first few years of our uh, time in town? That's how he referred to God. The man upstairs. No. He's a person, and he created us in his image, and so we have things in common with God, and we can know him. And he gave us Jesus, and Jesus is God with a face on. God with skin on. That's why the Gospels, and we we read about the ministry of Jesus, it, it, it speaks to us because we can, we see God. So I want to talk about some real honest prayers that I've prayed. I, um, these are all show business prayers, I think, or most of them. I, uh, we had worked at Harris for 10 years, we we're gonna show there, and uh, our last contract ended. And so now we were facing, you know, those of you in construction, certain businesses, you know what I'm talking about. It can be feast or famine. So now we don't know what we're doing next. And my brother and sister and I prayed about God provide, you know. So we were given the option of two shows. One was up in Reno, and one was in Laughlin. And the uh, show, uh, it just so happened that the the two uh, eight-week periods, two months, were the exact same weeks for both shows, and they were the exact same money. So we decided we would go to Laughlin because we were, you know, we had our lives here in town. If we went to Reno, We'd have to leave everything. And I led worship at a uh, church at that time, and I didn't want to abandon them for two months. So we decided we'd go to Laughlin, same money, same amount of weeks. And so we had prayed and committed that to God. And also, I had taken money out of savings. I'd saved up kind of like emergency fund, and uh, I needed new carpeting in my house. I had a house uh, 
that uh, somebody previously owned, and they had this beautiful green shag carpet in it in the 1980s. It actually turned out to look pretty, pretty good, but it was starting to tear up in places, so I decided I'm gonna replace the carpet, and I had this amount of money saved, and somebody gave me a check for $1,200 and said, I know you want new carpeting, so with that $1,200 check and what I had saved, carpeted the house. So we start this show, we do this show in Reno, and five weeks into it, they run out of money. It's just a typical show business thing. And um, so now we're back home. And it just so happened it was just before uh, George Bush the first was elected. It was election day. So he came up, voted. And I was praying because, you know, ran out of funds. I got no work. So I don't remember what else I prayed. But I, as I prayed, I said to God, God, I can't eat this white carpeting. So the next day, we got called to go up to Reno. It was uh, Legends in Concert was up there, and they desperately needed some zip in that show. And we went up and zipped the show. And because of that, uh, we got six months of work down here in Las Vegas in Legends, and then we would go up uh, from that time and perform with people like Juice Newton, some of you know these names, and Michael Martin Murphy, and the McGuire sisters, and Bob Newhart, and... Uh, who was the other one? Rita Coolidge. And uh, so, you know, see, God honors, God honors just what's coming out of our hearts. So important that we just be honest with the Lord. Matthew 5, 8 says this. Blessed, Jesus said this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That's, that's what, what I'm talking about, people, is just being pure in heart. Just telling it like it is to the Lord. And, and that's purity, and we see God move. We see God. I had a few years later, I uh, thought I am tired of this roller coaster ro ride in show business, working sometimes, working for a while, having time off. I'm going back to school. I'm gonna go back and get my teaching degree, and I'm gonna get into an easy profession like teaching. So, <laughs> I know better. <laughs> Stable, let's say. So, um, I was doing classes at UNLV, and I was working, and I mean, just all kinds of things. And so, finally, I thought, you know what? I'm going to sell my house, and I'm going to take the money that I have saved, and I'm going to take the money from the sale of my house, and then I can just move back east and go through school and not have to work while I'm going to school. So I had a for sale sign on the lawn, and it was on the lawn for about two weeks, and not one person looked at my house. And so one morning I was praying, and uh, just as I was ready to conclude the prayers, I looked out at my front lawn, and I saw that for sale sign, and I said, God, please help this house to sell fast. And a little thought came into my mind. I thought, well, what if God wants you to stay here? What if he doesn't want you to sell the house and move away? And I didn't want to hear that. But I thought, well, if, it's, if God wants me to, yeah, it wouldn't be a good idea if God wants me to stay here. So I said this prayer. All right, God, if you, if, if you want me to stay here, you better do something fast. Amen. <laughs> so I went to uh, the athletic club that afternoon. I was just doing my workout, and I started talking to somebody, and this guy said, oh, they're having auditions at Jubilee. Well, I never auditioned for anything. I always worked as an actor. I never worked as a singer by myself, but I thought, okay, you know what? I'll go to that audition. I'll audition on my way out of town. I'll show God I'm making an effort to stay here, but I'm going to leave. And so I uh, put this little resume together, was driving to Bally's for the auditions that day, and uh, I really wanted the job. All of a sudden, it's like, I really want this. So I prayed, God, give me favor, and I'm going to go in and audition. So I was the second man up to audition. There were 40 men auditioning for one part, and I got the part. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that came from just saying, God, you better do something fast if you want me to stay. And sure enough, he wanted me to stay, and I was, got into that show and was in there a year. And then I uh, did sell my house. Everything lined up. I sold real quickly, and I moved back east, and everything, all the doors opened. Two months later, I was back here in Las Vegas. So, uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes God just has to take us the long way around. 
Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Boldly. Huh. Now, people, honest prayers are not always confrontational. They're not always as abrupt as what I've been sharing with you. I, I want to share a, pr a prayer that was written by A.W. Tozer in a classic book called The Pursuit of God. If you've never read The Pursuit of God, read The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. And when I read this prayer, it just connected to my heart. And he writes this. Father, I want to know thee. But my cowardly heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without rival. Thou, then shalt thou make the place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it, for thyself will be the light in it, and there shall be no night there. In Jesus' name, amen. Much more formal of a prayer, these and thou's, but so honest. Man, he just, he just captured me. Times I don't want to give up the toys. Times I don't want to let loose. I, I, I fear it. It's honesty. We read all three. Read the Psalms. You'll hear heartfelt prayers. You'll hear honest prayers. Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Listen to this prayer. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. That's a prayer. Somebody said, honesty saves everyone's time. Think about that. <laughs> honesty saves everyone's time. See, when we're not really honest, it's like trying to do surgery over a number of days. <laughs> Let's just take a, just do a little bit today and I don't want to hurt you too much, you know. You know, if you go to your doctor and you're not honest with them, you're not going to get the desired re re results, are you? When my father was in his 80s and I was in my late 50s, I took him to the doctor and on the way in, he's limping. Don't tell this doctor about my, about my ankle. <laughs> my dad was going through severe clinical depression. He didn't want me telling the doctor that. So I went in with my 82-year-old father and I'm in my 50s, late 50s, and I'm talking to this doctor and I say, because my dad's telling him nothing. So I said, I need to tell you, my father is experiencing really deep depression because I lived with my dad around him, you know, not right in the same house, but. So this doctor doesn't look at me. See, I'm, I'm not there just to ride. I'm there because I got to be my dad's mind and his mouth, you know. You know how this is. So the doctor looks, Mr. Walker, he looks at my dad. Why do you think you're depressed? And my dad tells him a bunch of gobbledygook. And this doctor is suggesting he try a different, a new food every day. <sighs> so we got nowhere, you know. That stupid doctor and my obstinate dad, you know. <laughs> if you're going to have your bathroom or kitchen remodeled, be direct with whoever's doing it. Let them know exactly what you want, you know. Even when you go to a restaurant and order food, spell it out, you know. If you want extra gluten, like I do, ask for the side of gluten. <laughs> and it's the same way with God. He says, you have not because you ask not. We need to ask. Now, we're going to close here in a minute. James 5.16, I want to read this from the Amplified Bible. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. Now listen to this. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. I want to 
share one more prayer as we get ready to close. And um, now I'm cautious when I tell you about this because I don't want to put a conviction that God laid on me on you. See, sometimes God will, God is very individual with us. He, he's not, he may say, he may tell Kathy to do this or not do this. It may, it may just be some little thing. And he may give me the freedom to do it. So I always enjoyed a glass of wine. And I never abused it. I abused other things, not wine. So I'd have a nice glass of wine. I really enjoyed wine. And Mike turned 50, and I, I had a number of parties that year. And I had some wine at uh, the last party. And I went home that night, and I just felt kind of convicted about it. Like, maybe I wasn't real sharp the rest of the evening. Because I think I had two glasses that night. So it just was kind of there through the week. And then I went to this Bible study on Thursday night. And... Um, the pastor that was teaching the Bible study said he did not permit anybody on his staff to have wine. Oh, that just incensed me. Because the Bible, you know, Jesus drank wine, called him a wine bibber. You know, not, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't have a glass of wine. So I left that Bible study and a bunch of us went to eat and I ordered my glass of wine. And I said, did you hear what he said? Just didn't that the most ridiculous thing about him telling his, the rest of the pastors they couldn't have a glass of wine from time to time. Nobody else seemed to be listening to me. Or just. So I got home that night and it, I was so upset because that year we were supposed to go to Australia at the end of the year and Australia has all this wine country and I always like my one glass of wine after the show. Just a glass of wine, people. I'm not sinning. So it was eating at me so much and I was just ready to get in bed and it was just eating at me. And so I said this to God. Okay, God, I don't know if this is you, but if it's not you, I, I, I'm not going to, I've given up enough in my life. I don't want to give up if this, I'm not giving this up if it's not you. You better make it real clear to me if you want me to stop drinking wine. And I went to bed and about two in the morning I woke up and I thought of the scripture, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. And I think, well, I already know that. What, you know, why is that? So I thought, is God trying to talk to me? So I said, okay, God, I already know that, that scripture that says, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So if it's you trying to speak to me, you better give me another scripture. And he directed me chapter and verse to Proverbs. Now, when Proverbs was written, it, they didn't break it into chapters and verses. But, you know, if you read Proverbs, there's a lot of chapters, 31 chapters and a whole lot of verses. So here's this, I don't know. I can't remember, I, I wrote it down in my Bible, I didn't bring it with me, the scripture verse, but I looked that scripture up, and it has to do with wine. <sighs> but I said, you know what, God, I knew the first one, and you always work in threes. This is just two scriptures, I would need one more scripture if you really want me <laughs> not to drink wine. And all of a sudden, I get this chapter and verse of Habakkuk. How many read Habakkuk this week? That's what I thought. <laughs> Chapter and verse in Habakkuk, and it deals with wine. Two of them had negative things to say about wine. One of them had a positive thing to, to say about wine that related wine to the Holy Spirit. I said, that's it. Don't need to hit me over the head with a bottle of wine. Now, I don't tell anybody else because God had to make it very clear just to me. I don't even know why, people, I can't have a glass of wine. Maybe it's so... When I come Wednesday night, you don't smell wine on my breath. <laughs> when I was dealing with my elderly parents, I would have killed to be drinking something, you know. <laughs> but I just knew, you know, you know when it's God, and I just was honest. So let's get ready to close. Let's look at that prayer again. Exodus 5, 22 and 23. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble upon his people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Amen. <laughs> Is that any way to talk to God? You better believe it, people. I want to close 
was something that was written by a 17th century Roman Catholic Frenchman by the name of Francois Fenelon. And these are the two paragraphs he wrote. He said, tell God all that is in your heart. As one unloads one's heart, its pleasures, its pains to a dear friend. Tell him your troubles that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys that he may sober them. Tell him your longings that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes that he may help you conquer them. Talk to him of your temptations that he may shield you from them. Show him the wounds of your heart that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved tastes for evil, your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insincere, how pride disguises you to yourself and others. If you thus pour out all your weaknesses, needs, troubles, there will be no lack of what to say. You will never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. People who have no secrets from each other never want for a subject of conversation. They do not weigh their words for there's nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of their heart without consideration. They say just what they think. Blessed are those who attain to such familiar, unreserved intercourse with God. Let's close. Lord Jesus was most critical of the religious community of his day. The people who seemed to do everything right and looked as though they were doing everything right, and yet Jesus saw their hearts and called them hypocrites. Lord, we want to be pure in your sight. The last thing we want is hypocrisy or fakeness. Lord, when something's pure, it means it's not mixed with anything. Pure maple syrup. Pure butter. <laughs> pure truth. Pure. So I pray, Father, that our prayers, that our relationship with you would be unguarded and would just be direct, would be honest in the times where, Lord, where we just want to tell you we love you, we want to express it with all of our hearts. And in those times, Lord, where we're shaking our fist at you in our hearts but saying something different with our lips father please correct us and help us to be direct and honest and real before you before we close we're talking about just being real with god because god is real and god wants to have a real relationship with you and if any of you don't know how to have that relationship, to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity. I'll, I'll pray with you. And you can ask God to come into your life and be real. And you can have the kind of relationship where you can talk with God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Anybody in here want Jesus to come into their life, into their heart? Anyone at all want Jesus to come in? See, hands up. Some of you I know have already done that so those are renewal but Isaac this may be first time you've ever never asked Jesus right into your heart well we're going to pray we're all going to pray together okay and then I'll talk to you after the service okay let's all pray together because we all need continually to ask God to come into our hearts so just pray after me dear heavenly father I come before you I have nothing to offer you but myself, but my life. I confess to you that I want to know you, but my sinful thoughts and my sinful actions separate me from you. So I come looking at the sacrifice of Jesus, at the blood of Jesus Christ, to wash over me and to forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. You said, if we come to the door and he's knocking and we open that door, he'll come in. 
So Jesus, come into my heart. Rule my life. I yield my life to you. I will serve you all the days of my life. I will come to know you better each day. And when I fall down, when I sin, I will come back to you. I will get up and I will continue on. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and bless me, Lord, in your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap.